The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Creation Today. If you have high blood pressure, you may want to go take some medication before you watch today's show. That's your warning. Welcome to the Creation Today Show, where we bring together interviews with experts and solid Bible teaching. Your host, Eric Hovind, affirms the ultimate authority of God's Word, the truth of creation, and why it matters to you. Welcome to the Creation Today Show. I am your host, Eric Hovind. Many of you are going to be shocked by what you hear and what you see today. I say this Literally as a warning, we're going to be talking about the Black Hebrew Israelite movement. Most of you have never even heard of this movement before, but it is growing incredibly fast and it's dangerous. Here is a little bit of an encounter that I had not long ago with the Black Hebrew Israelites. I just want to know what you guys think about white people. Well, hey, at the end of the day, we love all people. You understand that? We love all people, but guess what? We're going to keep God's commands. That's what we're going to do. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21. Uh Prepare slaughter for his children. Prepare slaughter for who? For his children. The Bible says prepare slaughter for his children. So you believe all all white people should be slaughtered? For the iniquity of of their fathers. Read that last part again. For the iniquity of their fathers. Father. So God is going Talk to punish about those that have done evil to us. Wow. So hang on. You believe all white people should be killed? Yes. And all thine adversaries, every one of them. Every single one of them. So what do you think? That means their children, their wives, Good. every single one So you think we ought to be going around killing white people? One That's of them right shall go into captivity. I shall go into captivity. That's God's God. For those of you on YouTube or on Facebook, or if you're listening to the Creation Today podcast or watching the Creation Today show on TV, I want to say thank you for peeking into the Creation Today community. Uh, We are just a group of people that are turning stumbling blocks into stepping stones on the journey to know Christ. If you ever want to join our little community, come on over to creationtoday.org. We'd consider it an absolute honor to partner with you as we fulfill the Great Commission together. Joining me to discuss this growing movement is a man who has gone toe to toe with the black Hebrew Israelites on the streets. Uh, He has studied them. He has debated them. He has exposed them. Uh, Many of the black Hebrew Israelites absolutely hate him and can't wait for him to be, well, as they say, one of their slaves. He runs an awesome YouTube channel called The Street Apologist. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest, Mr. Vocab Malone. How you doing, Mr. Vocab? I'm doing excellent. It's great to be here at Creation Today, Eric. Man, thank you for hanging out with me. I've always wondered, is Vocab your real name? No. I was I, like, dude, that's got to be a street name, right? Well, yeah. So uh, I used to do some Christian hip hop, you know, with guys like Haz Akeem and John Rubin. And uh, then I uh, got into kind of slam poetry, and uh, vocab was the name I was rolling with. And then since I got into urban apologetics, it seemed to still fit. That's awesome. That's well, it is. It does fit, and it's really cool. And I've always been jealous of guys like you that have a way with your vocabulary, have a way with words to put it in a way that's uh, uh, relevant to the people today, to where they're going to hear. Um, hey, by the way, if you're joining me on one of the social media pages, uh, YouTube or Facebook, and you're on live with me right now, or hey, one of our partners, thank you guys for hanging out with us, uh, Gary and Andrew and Amber and Tony and Robert and all you guys that are on here. Thank you guys. We got a little giveaway. Vocab, I didn't ask you about this ahead of time, but can I pay for a couple of your books and you ship them out to some of our friends? Can I do that? That would be awesome. I yeah, want, I want to give away yep. your new book, Barack Obama. <laughs> That's the one I wanted to give away. Barack okay. Obama versus the Black Hebrew Israelites. If we can give that one away. If you want to win a copy of this book right here, all you got to do is type in the comments where you are tuning in from, what city and state or what country, where you're tuning in from. Uh, I'd love to give away a couple copies of, of that book. It is uh, so good. And he's got his Street Level Apologetics. That's another fantastic book. So if you want to be entered into that drawing, simply comment in the chat where you're tuning in from. And uh, at the end of this first half hour, we'll give away a couple of his books. Vocab, I I was exposed to the Black Hebrew Israelite movement several years ago. 
was shocked by the things that I was hearing. Uh, and then to, to go, I was, I was traveling somewhere. I stopped to fill up with gas and I see him on the street corner and I'm like, let me just go have a conversation with them. I'm like, well, what do you guys think about white people knowing what they really think? And to hear them actually come out and, and verbalize very boldly what they think about it. Ah, oh, we're going to have to get into the overview. We're going to have to get into the history. We're going to have to get into the cultural problems with this. We're going to have to get into the, is it scriptural and historically accurate? Um, and, and kind of get into the reasoning why this has become popular. So can you real quick tell us, how did you get involved? Why, why, why did this become one of your specialties? Cause it's, it's mm-hmm. certainly something you're really good at at discussing and talking about. I appreciate that. You know, I was doing a lot of stuff with uh, Islam, atheism, uh, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons to a certain extent, Roman Catholics, and some other groups uh, like Five Percenters, Nation of Islam. And uh, one day I got a call from a buddy who said, hey, I know you study religion. He wasn't a believer, so that's kind of how he put it. And there's these guys uh, on the south side of Columbus, east side of Columbus, where I'm originally from, and they're like, person into services and creating problems and all this. And then he described them to me and I was like, man, brother, I'm sorry. I can't help you. I don't, I'm not really sure what you're talking about here, but I looked it up based upon what he was saying to me. And I found the specific group he was talking about. It was on a, uh, a website called lively, kind of like an underground YouTube type thing. I don't recommend going there, but I found a bunch of their stuff there. And, uh, I said, what, what is this? And I just kind of binge watched and, uh, just kind of filed it away type of thing, you know? And then one day, I saw them on the corner in real life in my neighborhood. I said, I know what that is. And I said, I bet no one else on that corner knows what that is. <laughs> and so I stopped and talked to him, uploaded it to a blog I was running at the time. And the response was so overwhelming. I said, oh, this is an undertapped area. Lord, should I get into this? And after some meditation, prayer, talking with people, I transitioned from really Islam, which I was mainly focusing on at the time, and that kind of became my number two instead of my number one as far as the polemical element of apologetics. And I thought it would maybe be short term, but instead of going away, the problem's gotten worse. Wow. So here I am until the Lord moves me or one of the, you know, Salafi Muslims or Hebrew Israelites get me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing is they talk like that. They talk about what they want to do to you. They they matter of fact, I grabbed a clip, the Kent, it's clip number five, the one that I am Jesus Christ. I, I grabbed this clip. Hang on just a second before you play it. I was shocked, absolutely shocked at what I was hearing. And if you've never been exposed to the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, you're gonna be shocked when you hear this kind of of message being proclaimed on the street. And this is growing. Kent, real clip five. So who's the best representation representation of Christ right now that you see? Best representation like of a human? Yes. Jesus Christ? Yeah. It's me. It's me. You're looking at Christ-like individuals right now. Yes. Why? Because we're the same race yes. and we follow what Christ was teaching and we're from the same tribe. We're from the same bloodline. Yes. You are a stinking, filthy liar yes. and you don't have any remorse for what your people have done to my people. You don't have any heart. You're a coward. You are, you are a coward and your family it are murderous bastards Man. and you come up here and you want to lie to a prophet of the Lord. You can't say you're following what God says because God said that you shall bow down to us, the real prophets and you won't do it. Get on your knees in front of the prophets, the real prophets of the Lord Man. because Christ was from the tribe of Judah and black people, the Negroes here in America that you stole their identity, they are from the tribe of Judah and you won't even bow to the closest representation of Christ on the earth. You are a stinking, filthy piece of garbage. You so That's why we say the white man is the devil that the Bible speaks of. Your whole family oppressed my family and you're going to come up here and try to lie to me. Wow. So you're used to hearing this vocab. A lot of people are going, What? This takes place on these guys are declaring this publicly. I mean, they're they're they really believe this. OK, well, I definitely think the foot soldiers and, and officers and kind of grunts of these organizations believe it. And if they don't, they kind of like the perks of, you know, having a religious authorization to shout at people and, you know, express anger and have their boots kissed like you see that guy was pining for there. 
So now some of these leaders, man, I don't know, Eric. Some of these leaders, I think, are some scam artists, to be frank with you. I'm not saying all of them, I'm not saying, but some of these guys, the way they operate is like clearly like a like a pyramid scheme more than a than a, a legit religion, you know. And and when you said officers and stuff like that, they really do set up their their society, their culture, their religion, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. They set it up as a very militaristic style, don't they? The One West Hebrew Israelites do. Okay. One West is a type. It's not a particular name. So One West is not one group. One West is kind of an umbrella that encompasses many groups. Consider Pentecostal. That's not a denomination, but there's many Pentecostal groups, right? One West is a type of Hebrew Islamism that has the militant as well. However, every now and then you'll run into one of the Old Testament only Hebrew Israelite groups. And Old Testament only means they're not one West because one West say they accept the New Testament. Some of these Old Testament only Hebrew Israelites also are becoming somewhat militarized. Um, but just so everyone's clear, they are not like um, revolutionaries by and large. They all say this is only when Yahweh Shai, as they would call him, is going to come back. They don't think they're supposed to enact a revolution now. They think that's in the future, but that's why they have names like captain and officer so they can run the kingdom when Yahawashai does come back. Yahawashai is what they call Jesus in one West lingo. Okay. Yeah. Now this is, so I just got a comment on social media from, uh, and I was going to tell this story later, but I'm, he, he commented here. Uh, I've got a couple friends uh, that are in the black Hebrew Israelite movement. And this is uh, back when I was kind of first exposed to it. Uh, and Jared on social media said, Hey, I spoke to your entire family, Eric, when I visited your house in two, 2017, did I behave like this? No. And Jared, you did not. Uh, so, and this is where I want to be careful. I realize there are, as vocab is saying, different sex and different uh, beliefs mm -hmm. in this. And I want you to unpackage that a little bit, but Jared, no, we actually, you stood right here about 10 feet away from where I'm standing right now uh, and shared with, with my family and our ministry. I'd met him at the airport. He's, if I remember correctly, in the FBI and uh, came here, we met at the airport, ended up coming over to the ministry and sharing some of these thoughts. And Jared, I remember after that going, Okay, I'm a little concerned by some of the things that I'm hearing because I feel like the scriptures were taken out of context. And and vocab, I want to get into some of the scriptures uh, that are that are taken out of context. But by the way, Kent, um, I think it's uh, clip number three. This is what happened to me when I when I was trying to find out. Okay, well, what is it that they believe? What what exactly is it that they believe that that makes them come to some of the conclusions they come to? And and here's how it went. Clip, Kent, clip three. But How do you feel about Israelites? Um, well, I think that's that's the big question. And I want you to be honest with me, too. That's the big question is, who are the true Israelites? Who are the Jews? And that's what we're trying to figure out now. But we already know because the Bible says it. We know. We are. The problem is there's a uh, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that's taken out of context. And when okay. taken in context, makes a big difference. Makes a huge difference. He said there's a passage in Deuteronomy that's taken out of context. Mm. Verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. Now the word Egypt means it's synonymous with something else. Go to Exodus 20 and let's get what the word Egypt means. All right? Because it's synonymous with something else. All right? So read what you got. Exodus chapter 20 verse 2. Uh -huh. I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, uh -huh. out of the house of bondage. So Egypt is synonymous with bondage or slavery. With ships. With what? With ships. Now, that is recorded in history, right? You would agree that we were brought into slavery on part of a slave ship, right? So he goes in and says, hey, we know that because the the, the black people were sold into slavery and brought to America in ships, then Deuteronomy is talking about this. Hey, part of me goes, okay, how, how do you, how do we take, I mean, there, there's people watching, obviously Jared is on here watching and he, as far as I know, Jared, you're still in the black Hebrew Israelite movement. We got people in the movement. We got people that have no clue what the movement is, no clue of all the different, uh, you know, sex out there. How do you start to try to help people understand how it came about? Let's start there. And mm -hmm. then let's get into some of the scriptures they use like that and go, okay, are they taking this in context? <sighs> Educate us here. Well, Deuteronomy 28 is foundational to Hebrew Israelism. I mean, here's a whole book. It's, that's literally what it's called, uh, written by a Hebrew Israelite. So that is <clears throat> very foundational, especially verse 68. They focus yeah. on the curses. And the way Hebrew Islamism started, there's some murkiness to it, but it's older than most people realize, but younger than most Hebrew Israelites claim. 
So we're talking um, <clears throat> post reconstruction, the late 1880s, early 1890s is the first time we have people explicitly saying black folks are the true Israelites. And the first two folks we have saying this on record, both received this, uh, according to their testimony, via a vision. Uh, a guy named Reverend William Christian, who essentially was a Protestant pastor really till the end of his life. He just also had this new element to his teaching, which was early Hebrew Israelism. And I have his book. It's available in the Library of uh, Congress. And so it's publicly available on a website I'm getting up and running called HebrewIsraeliteInfo.com. So you can actually download the book from a website I'm constructing. And then the second one that we have recorded is William Crowdy. He's usually given credit as the first, but Christian appears to be before him. Uh, one from Arkansas, Texas area, and the other from Oklahoma, Kansas area. Now, they, it's spread out later on. And Crowdy also says he received a vision. And both of these guys were pretty um, cool, to use a lack of a better phrase, with other ethnic groups. They didn't have the same kind of hard militancy that later Hebrews lights would adopt. But they did say we're the real Israelites. Um Later on, you get a guy named F.S. Cherry. Sometimes he's credited as the first Hebrew Israelite, but I've done deep research in this along with actually some ex-Hebrew Israelites. And long story short, Cherry did not start in 1886 like he claimed. That was a lie he made up because he was only like 11 at the time. Cherry started later, but Cherry, F.S. Cherry of Philadelphia did bring that militancy to Hebrew Israelism. He was a lot more militant in the stuff he would say, a lot more flamboyant, incendiary, uh, a lot more uh, imprecatory to use a biblical phrase regarding other peoples as he would have it so that element was in there and and so that's kind of when we get started 1919 very important congregation called the commandment keepers was established in harlem very uh, kind of rabbinical judaism basically and then 50 years later 1969 a number of people came out of that group and established another smaller school in harlem that eventually had the dress of one west 125th street and all the kind of ideas really permeated, circulated there. And that's why we now call a certain strand of Hebrew Islamism One West Hebrew Islamism because their address at the time was One West 125th Street. Hmm. And uh, that spawned a lot of different camps. In fact, the group you were in, interacting with there, Eric, Israel United in Christ, IUIC, uh, the leader did attend the old One West School in Harlem, New York, till it disbanded, and he started his own thing, which is actually now the most successful One West branch there is, uh, approaching 10,000 members. IUIC, the Purple and Gold guys, just their group alone. So we've come a long way, come a long way, Eric. And these, just so everybody understands, these are individuals who would say the 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 black africans that were brought over as slaves and their ancestors are the true jews that that the bible is so when the bible talks about the jewish people it's talking about them can you explain like literally from their perspective how they're coming to those conclusions or where that's coming about yeah sure and it is important to understand uh, a correlation of that here's a book by hebrews alike correlation of that is that people that call themselves israelites today are all frauds so, uh, yes. There's a, so they're yeah. saying all the people that claim to be Jews, the people that start, you know, started the nation of yeah. Israel in 1948 and are claiming Judaism are actually not the real Jews. So, so what would they call them? What would what would be their? Uh, a lot of times they'll call them Edomites, That's but they're a little more specific. Sometimes they'll say Amalekites. Amalekites uh, are actually a, a tribe related to Esau. Yeah. And if you remember, Haman was an Amalekite. So sometimes they'll say they're uh, Amalek. And wow. sometimes they use other terms. They'll call them small hats or Ashka Nazis. These are terms that I've all wow. heard them use. You know, they'll say stuff like that. Um, and that's that's an element. It's like the pie is not big enough. You know, they got to push someone out to get in there. Deuteronomy 28, 68 is a key verse, as mentioned. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves. But there will be no buyer. Okay, so what is going on there? Well, it's important yeah, to understand what's happening in Deuteronomy 28. Uh, have, have you been able to look at Deuteronomy 28 much since these interactions? Yeah, just a little bit. But I mean, I just take the one verse in context, there will be no buyer. And I'm like, well, okay, that's out. I mean, you're, you're done. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, let's focus on that verse for a second. What they do is they say, well, that Hebrew word sometimes can mean to redeem in a non-monetary way. 
And so what this is saying is that no one is going to be able to save the Israelites except for God himself. So that's what that's what that, that's the way they turned that into. And uh, they'll say John Brown couldn't do it. Martin Luther King couldn't do it. Nat Turner couldn't do it. Malcolm X couldn't do it. Only God can do it. And they'll say that's what it means. But I want to draw your attention to something within that, right? Uh, because you have this these uh, kind of monetary words used that deal with transactions and sales. You know, you will offer yourselves for sale as your enemies, uh, to your enemies, as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. Now, that's the ESV rendering. The KJV or the NKJV is a little different here. It says, there you will be sold. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that if you want me to go in depth on the why the translations are different there. But either way, you have a clear thing of a financial transaction going on. So it only makes sense to say there will be no buyer it relates to the selling element. But they change it. The, the 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 selling is literal for them, but the buying is sort of metaphorical. But there's something important about this word buyer or, or no buyer. So the Hebrew word there, quana, uh, quana, uh, there in that sense, it's a verb, qual, participle, masculine, singer, absolute. And when it's used that way in the Hebrew from all the examples I've seen, it does mean a physical transaction. This whole, it means redemption thing doesn't apply when the word is used this way. There are examples where you can find sort of a non-monetary element, but that's not what it's saying. It's not saying no one's gonna uh, sort of rescue us as a whole unless we keep the laws, which is how they interpret it. Now, what is going on here? Okay, the reason why they're offering themselves for sale is because they'll be in such a destitute condition. All they have left is their body. They're saying, buy me as an indentured servant. So the no buyer is essentially hyperbole for saying no one's your the demand for your services is going to be very low. And we do have some uh, evidence that when Jews were in these conditions in places such as Egypt, that they were sold uh, or they were bought, if you want to put it that way, very cheaply. And so that's what that's saying, because otherwise it's not a curse. Why would it be a curse to say you – uh, try to sell yourself, but no one will buy you, or you're going to be sold, no one will buy you. That'd be a good thing. The reason why it's a curse is saying you're going to want to be able to sell your services, but no one's going to be able to do it. That's why it makes sense as a curse. So their interpretation doesn't fully make sense of the fact that it's a punishment for Israel for being disobedient. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the element of you will sell yourselves, that is a more accurate rend rendition. And the reason why is the Hebrew word makar, makar, when it is in the way that it's in here, and what here's what I mean by that, the the hit file, whenever it's that, it's always a reflexive, which which means you do this. This is something you're doing. This is not something being done to you in that way. And so uh, this should be translated as it is, to be frankly, in some of the more modern translations. And that's why they reflect that. But they like the older rendering because it appears that they're being sold. But again, that doesn't make sense of the curse, even in context of the passage, forgetting about Hebrew Islamism for a second. You know, you'll be sold, but there will be no buyer. Why would that be a curse? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Then, you know, you're not going to go into slavery. So that's what's going on there. Now, that's a lot to take in with them there, right? I understand all that, but you can still call them on the fact of, you know, this, this element of making redemption kind of what it's about instead of like buy. And uh, that's important to understand. And then this whole thing says it's in Egypt. They just make it any kind of bondage. They'll say Egypt can be house of bondage. But if you look at the passage, Eric, Egypt's mentioned two other times in Deuteronomy 28, and it means actual Egypt. And it also <laughs> says a journey I promise you should never make again. Well, they were in Egypt, and God is saying, I'm going to essentially undo the exodus as your punishment. That's what's going on here. That makes perfect sense. Just you can't go to a place you've never been. So they, they've never been to America. So how are you going right. back? They'll say, oh, it's back into slavery. So it's literal ships figurative Egypt. The whole thing is what I call a case of Hebrew hopscotch, where you skip and jump and alternate methodologies within the text. And Hebrew hopscotch also is where they'll go to somewhere else. So a lot of times when I get into the weeds with guys on this, they jump to some other place. It's almost like, well, yeah, but what about this? You know, to try to prove the point of Deuteronomy 20, 68. Now, this is not their only verse, but this is a verse you commonly hear read on the street. And they basically make ships, slave ships, and say it's a transatlantic slave trade. But here's the thing. We already have examples of Israelites going into Egypt, even in the scripture itself and in history itself, whether it's Josephus or other examples. And in Jeremiah, we see Israelites in Egypt, and, and, and we already see that at the end of Jeremiah. So we don't need to leapfrog over to the transatlantic slave trade to find 
the fulfillment of these curses. And even that's weird. This is not a prophetic passage. It's a passage reiterating the law and what will happen. It's almost contractual or covenantal. So it's not like looking for the prediction to be fulfilled. It's saying, where did God enact these punishments upon Israel? And we see it right in the pages of scripture. And they'll say, yeah, but, and then they'll jump over there to try to make themselves the fulfillment. And last thing, they got a 12 tribes chart on there includes Native Americans and Hispanics. This is if you're a one Wester. They didn't experience a transatlantic slave trade. So they do other things like, well, the Indians did go into slavery for a time and they do other stuff, but it doesn't even work for them. So they have all kinds of problems with their religion. But out on the street, it can be very convincing. Now, I did see that they had set up their 12 tribes and they set up, you know, the different. You know, so Benjamin is really these people and Judah is really these people. And it would just keep going down through saying, where does that come? Is that is that literally created? Is it literally made up or is there is there any kind of logical rationale for why they've come up with that tribe and these groups? Well, the real story and Hebrews lights will tell you this is that uh, a guy says that he had a vision. He had a, a vision about this, and, and it was confirmed to him. And we have two different guys who are claimed with receiving this vision. Abba Bivens and Ariyah are their names. Ariyah is still alive. He's like in his 80s. Abba Bivens is, is long dead. And uh, what Hebrews lights who are aware of the history of this will say, yeah, but we were already studying, and, and then the Lord just confirmed it there. But the fact is, basically, it comes through the claim of a vision, and they use Genesis 49 for the basis. So if you go to Genesis 49, it's where Jacob is blessing his sons, and he calls them all together, and then he names every son, which obviously becomes a tribe, and says a little something, something about them. Yep. And the little something, something that he says about them, one Westers use, I should say, misuse, to try to identify with modern-day people groups. Let me give you an example. Genesis 49, 19. I'm going to go here about Gad. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Raiders shall raid Gad, and he shall raid at their heels. Now, it's only a couple lines there. I'm going to also show that uh, from the um, from the KJV. Do you, do you have a KJV in front of you? I want to show you because that's what they use. Mine's, I want to show you what. I use the Evidence Study Bible, and they used to be KJV. Now it's in KJV. I'm sorry. <laughs> let me show you Genesis 49, 19 in the KJV because I think uh, you'll kind of see, I guess, maybe where they're going with this. Gad, a troop shall overcome, but he shall overcome at the last. So a little bit different rendering there. Hebrew Israelites say gathered the Native Americans, and the troops are the U.S. Cavalry who defeated Native Americans. But at the end, the Native Americans who are actually Gad are going to defeat the U.S. and the wicked forces behind them. That's an example. Well, I refrained from showing some other clips that I saw because I felt like it was just a little too extreme, even for the Creation Today show. When you when you have clips of black Hebrew Israelites on a corner talking to women, talking about how they will be their concubines, you're going to be my concubine. Here's what I'm going to do to you. Oh, you wouldn't be good as my wife, but I'll have you as a concubine and you'll be happy to serve me. You'll be happy to do these things. And, and hearing them flamboyantly talk about the things that they're going to do with this, this woman standing on the street is just shocking to me. Um, I, mm -hmm. I Listen, I got to let social media go right now. Guys, I, I wish you guys had come over to Creation today and just be a partner with us, help us reach the world. But we're going to, I want to go more into uh, the, the scientific accuracy. Uh, Gary's wondering about the um, the genetics. Does genetics show this? I want to talk about that. Talk more about the Bible because it seems like they just take things out of one thing after another. They take out of context and they take a little sound bite here and a sound bite here, a little one phrase of a verse here and one phrase of a verse over here. And they put all these together and, and they teach it as if it all flows rather than teaching the whole counsel of God. Do you, do you find that like consistent? Like, they yeah, and that's why do? I've termed it Hebrew hopscotch. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. Now they'll justify it with a passage in Isaiah that says here, little there, little precept upon precept, line upon line. But I would challenge people to look at that actual verse. Um, when you look at that verse, what it appears is happening is the Israelites are mocking or belittling the counsel from the prophets of God. Mm -hmm. When they're saying here, little there, little, they're saying, oh, you're just giving us this baby talk stuff. And you're just giving these, these do's and don'ts, these rules. That's what's happening. Um, not an instruction for hermeneutics or exegesis. And not only that, let's just say it was. So God, what, waited, I think, what, 700 years or so 
You know, it's like, how long is uh, the Isaiah after, you know, Moses? <laughs> and God's like, well, now let me tell you how to, you know, actually interpret the scripture. You know, so they use it, but really it's an excuse to pretext stack. You know, they stack one bad interpretation in front of another. And here's why they do that. It's very, it's very deceptive, frankly. When it comes to a passage that is clearly and explicitly uh, so truthful, truthful against one of their positions, they often really can't handle it directly. So they go to presuppositions they have in other passages as if they're uh, saying one thing and saying, well, th- so it can't mean that because of this instead of dealing with it directly. That's what they do. And if you watch them carefully, no matter how loud it is or confident they are, you realize a lot of these guys, that's what they're doing. And with all due respect, so to Jared, my bet would be Jared probably is a really nice guy, and I praise God for the nice he Israelites. I had a great time with him. My bet is Jared does the same thing, just in a in a nicer, calmer way. And that's I, because you can't get Hebrew Israelism out of Scripture, frankly. You can get little pieces where it looks like a, an element of it, but you can't get Hebrew Islamism proper out of the Scriptures, frankly. And I'm just I'm just saying. I want to give away a couple copies of your book, Barack Obama versus the Black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, We'll ship this out to you. My winners are Steve Brinkley. Steve Brinkley, watching on Facebook, uh, please comment or, or, excuse me, message us your address so we can do that. You can send it via email, Eric. Hovind at creationtoday.org, Eric Hovind at creationtoday.org, and uh, Robert uh, Grosnick, Robert Grosnick right here. I see you watching uh, as one of my partners. Thanks for commenting, Uh, and you are the winner of the book. Please, actually, we should already have your address. If we don't have it, email it to us, Eric Hovind at creationtoday.org. Guys, social media, I hate this. I got to let you go, but uh, if you want to watch the rest, I got a lot more questions for vocab as we unpackage the truth behind the Hebrew Israelite movement. Uh, Feel free to come on over to Creation today.org and partner with us for whatever you want. Next week's show is going to be awesome. We're talking to none other than Tim Mahoney. He's done a series of videos on the Exodus patterns of evidence. He's covered our patterns of evidence. He's covered Exodus. He's covered uh, Mount Sinai, or uh, excuse me, um, the Red Sea crossing. His latest video is coming out as a fathom event in theaters in a little more than a week. You don't want to miss it. Please check it out. But we're covering the journey to Mount Sinai next week with Tim Mahoney. Mahoney would love to have you right here 12 noon uh, for the creation today show on any of these channels thanks social media for watching come on over to creationtoday.org for the rest okay vocab i'm i i've experienced this i've experienced them hopping around then after i kind of confronted them a little bit uh kent what clip is it where they they wouldn't talk to me all of a sudden it's like they they stopped they just stopped talking to me uh clip number four kent here's what happened to me I'm like, okay, well, what about this? Here's what happened. What do you guys think about the fact that there's been more white slaves than black slaves throughout history? All right, I'm, I'm gonna deal with that. I'm gonna deal with this slavery, the things that we went through. As so, what do you guys think about? Yeah, there's a difference. Okay, let's go, right? So, if I can read this in the Bible, that will make the Bible. Does truth. anybody want to talk? Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. What do you mean, some part? Did you know? We didn't want to finish so talking. Happen, right? So if I can read it in the scriptures, that's what make Are we not having a conversation anymore? For security purposes, we can't be right here. Just stay on the sidewalk. Are we not talking, we're not talking anymore? You understand that? So let's deal with the truth, right? Get our revelation. Are we not? We're not going to have a conversation? You don't want to talk? So the truth is uh, getting salvation through Christ. But it's something else.